Hello, everyone, and I'm welcome to our Bite Size PD today. My name is Jonathan Stewart, and I'll be the one taking you on a journey as we look at using AI to increase student engagement. Um, make sure to uh, make sure to follow us on Canyons District. You see the website there below for Twitter, X, Instagram, and Facebook. Or you can follow along to get some great tips and ideas from Canyon School District. So I've already hit record as far as our professional development norms. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please reach out to me again, Jonathan Stewart with Canyon School District. I'm going to move this over here really quickly and we'll continue on. We have our MTSS framework and that guides what we do. The thing we're going to talk about, which has to do with our instructional priorities, is looking at student engagement and how we can use AI to handle that. Learning intention and success criteria today is I will learn how to use generative AI tools to increase student engagement um, with tools such as CurePod. That's one we're going to focus on today. I'll know when I'm successful when I can create my own activity with student-facing generative AI features such as a CurePod lesson. So let's get to our agenda and talk about what we will cover today. First, a basic, basic, small overview is what is AI and gener generative AI. That space there. Teacher-facing versus student-facing tools, and why it's important to understand the difference between each and making more engaging lessons with student-facing tools. And again, we will highlight the tool CurePod, which um, in summary is essentially think about Nearpod with AI features. We'll show you what that means in a little bit. First of all, what is AI? When I say AI, I think most people know this, but I just want to make sure that that is an acronym that stands for artificial intelligence. And that is the ability for computers and machines to mimic human thinking or cognition. We think of AI as a relatively new term, but as computers were becoming um, uh, more advanced, and I say that in quotes, in the 1950s, in the wake of, you know, in the wake of the computing needed to go to space and other things, um, Alan Turing actually coined a, a something called the Turing test. And basically, if a machine or a computer could do something indistinguishable from a human, then it would it was considered intelligent. And people basically trying to. Uh, follow through with artificial intelligence since then. Now, there are several types of artificial intelligence. There's a reactive, um, you know, when you, you know, when you push a button, a machine will hand you something. That's an example of reactive. Um, there's ones that make suggestions. There's several different types. But the one that we're going to talk about and that has become most familiar in the last couple of years is generative AI. That is a specific type of artificial intelligence where it doesn't just react to what you give it, but it can actually give out original output that is not tied to your specific, that is not directly tied to a specific input. Um, you know, rather than like you type a few keywords and it spits out a canned response, it can mimic more closely human conversation, activities, ideas, drawings, etc. And it's an original creation. It's often one that's not able to be duplicated very well anyway. And it uses algorithms, um, you know, which is a bunch of, a very complex set of rules to determine what should come next. And this is the type of, when you think of ChatGPT, and you've probably heard all about this if you're watching this, this is where ChatGPT falls. Um, it's a generative AI because you can talk to it and it will generate original ideas and content that aren't, weren't specifically programmed. So we'll get into some specifics about how AI works. Um, there is a very long definition that has a lot of complex things like layers, neural networks, large language models. Yeah, and you can read that definition and, and there, you can get into the complexities of how AI works. But for practical purposes, how it works when it comes to training uh, to what AI is as far as what you need to know. What it is, it is a training algorithm on a large data sets to learn patterns. And the type of AI that we're talking about 
um, the large data set is like the internet, the whole internet, and it trains on that. And as it trains on these algorithms or specific sets of rules, it eventually works towards the level where it can make predictions without explicit programming. For example, it can say that if you're writing a poem, the programmer doesn't have to say the poem needs to be four lines long. The algorithm is able to predict that that's what most people would like without it being explicitly told. It works on mathematical not models, and that's what these algorithms are, so they're patterns of predictions, and that becomes what's called a neural network. So neural networks are a thing that happen actually in your own brain. Um, it's a collection of uh, neurons and uh, electrical impulses that work together to, to fire away and, and help your brain work. And it, what they've done is they, if it mimics the neural networks in your brain, but instead of using like, like a, a biological tangible one, it uses that same, it mimics that same process, but uses um, computer servers, processing chips that go inside a computer to do that. And then over time, it will process information and improve its own performance. So we are on uh, GPT, uh, which is this large data set that uses the web. It's actually on version four. You can find version three for free, but usually if you're using version four, you have to pay for it because it, it is more encompassing, but it costs more money to maintain. So over time, this performance improves and ChatGPT came about when it came to a level where it would actually be useful to the average person. And they released that to try and get more training to improve the performance. And that's kind of where ChatGPT came from. Just wanted to share this quote because I think it's a great one. Um, this is from the U.S. Department of Education Technology. And um, it gives a great analogy because there's a lot of doom and gloom and people think that robots are taking over the world when it comes to artificial intelligence. But this is how they see the role of AI. We envision a technology enhanced future more like an electric bike and less like a robot vacuum. An electric bike, the human is fully aware of what's going on. They're fully in control. But their burden is less. Their effort is multiplied by complementary technology enhancement. So there was a lot of predictions as this was happening that, that oh, these are, you can just learn from the robot. It will replace a teacher. No, this is not, I, we're not even close to that being happening. And that's what the Department of Education Technology is trying to emphasize. It's trying to amplify what you're doing rather than replace you. And it makes you more efficient and you able to listen your cognitive load and your time. So you're able to focus on things that really matter. Student engagement, um, forming relationships, uh, coming up with a higher or level thinking task because you're not messing with the like menial stuff. And that's where that enhancement can come in. Now I wanted to talk, uh, when it comes to AI tools, you have many different tools. Uh, my my co-partner with the AI project, Emma and I, are actually doing a presentation at USET, which we'll have finished as this recording is happening, called uh, 60 and 60 AI Tools in Education. And we could have tripled that list. There's a lot of tools in education. But I think it's important to know what those tools are and what they do. You know, we highlight ChatGPT, and that's a general tool that anyone can use. There's Google has one called Gemini, Microsoft has one called Copilot. Um, that, so there are many different broad-based ones. And these tools are generally meant for adults when you look at their terms of service. They're not, they're not thinking kids, they're thinking of adults. And they're usually designated around productivity um, and creativity, but they're, but they're not necessarily focused on the education process. Um, just know that that is the focus of many AI uh, tools that are specifically looking at education. They're generally looking at helping the adults and the staff members. That's the majority of tools out there. 
I can get the links here to Magic School AI, which is a good broad-based AI tool that helps with planning, organization, communication. You can have it right IP goals. It has all kinds of great uh, prompts and ways to get AI information. It can help with questions. It can help with tests, all kinds of things. Question Well is, is an example of a more narrowly education-based tool. So Question Well is something that's designed to um, take a text or you can generate a text around a topic and then it will generate uh, questions for you and then you answer those questions or, and then and give you the answer to those questions and then you can take those questions and export it to Canvas, Quizzes, Kahoot, all, all those platforms that we use to do student quizzes. And these help with student engagement, but they're more they more help in planning for student engagement activities for the teacher, which is great. But that's not what we're going to focus on today, because what we're going to focus on today is the other tool, it is some other student facing tools that help with engagement directly, where the student will engage with these AI um, tools. Such a, and you generally that's through what's called a chat bot where, where it's a, a text-based reply, like you're chatting with someone, but the someone is a robot. So one thing that's really important to keep in mind when you think of student-facing tools is that they need to make sure that they are legally compliant and that they protect student data properly and that they are approved on the Learn platform. And so if they're approved on the Learn platform, they will meet the other two criteria. But if you're at a conference or running across a blog post or a buddy says, hey, have you heard about XYZ.AI? It's great. It does all these wonderful things. Make sure to check how they're using their data. This is especially true with AI. It's actually more true than with other programs because you're, you give, you're giving it a lot more information. And one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, there can be some legal ramifications. And that's why we try to prove tools through the Learn platform. I wanted to give you an example of a tool that is approved. They do a job, good job of protecting student data, especially because they don't collect any ELC. And um, they meet all the legal requirements for BUG, COPA, SIPA, all the other alphabets. And this tool is called Kirapod. So let's go ahead and explore. So here's Curapod. I have an account already, so I will log in, but you're able to go ahead and sign up. You can sign up with your district email or you can sign up with your CSD docs, but I'm going to go ahead and log in. And you'll notice when I go to log in, it will ask if I want to do it with my email or if I want to do it with Google. I choose my CSD docs. It's thinking, oh, I thought I had it CSD docs, but you are able to sign up through CSD docs. So I will go back and sign, dun, 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 and I will sign in with my Canyon District email. And voila, this is what the opening screen looks like. Like I said, CurePod is kind of like Nearpod with an AI touch. There's a lot, a lot of similarities to Nearpod. So there's a home screen there. This is a place where you have lessons. You can keep track of reports. So one, so CurePod has a couple of features that are very interesting. It will curify your slides. So one thing that it will do, which is great, is it will, oh, that's a new feature, a bilingual lesson. That is interesting. That's a new feature they just added there. You'll go to these tools and they were, there will always be something new when you come back um, because they're always constantly updating based on feedback they get from educators. So you can import your slides. It will actually generate lessons for you. It can generate a quiz. So it will actually generate uh, things that you can try and do, um, which, and so it will 
create the, you give it a topic, your grade level, throw in some standards, and it will create all the slides for you and create the activities for you. And then you would just go in and add an edit to make it suit what your needs are. So I don't believe I have a less, a good lesson. Oh yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so we will take this lesson. So this is a lesson that I had it right based on the right feedback repeat, which is one of their pre-made um, lessons that you can do. Like you can, it's a, it's a writing one. You can also just kind of go in and say, I teach science in eighth grade. And, oh. and it will kind of look for brain breaks, multiple choice. You know, do I want a, something for the sub? So you get it. Formative assessments. You can do full lessons. But I'm going to go with the lesson I have. And this is the lesson from a word of the day. Word of the day is like a, a pre-made pre template that then they will create a lesson from that template and then you can customize further. But we'll go to this right feedback repeat lesson. So this is something that Curapod created on my own. And I had it write a lesson about helping your, how can AI help your students learn more? So very again. And you can edit activities, add media, change the background. You can do translations. It's built in, it's very nice. Elements are more like shapes, stickers, that sort of thing. Media would be, you know, it has it has images here. Um, or you can upload your own. So you can kind of, you know, make it more your own. You can edit different activities. So first one, should schools have a four-day week? So you have your, I'm going to move this around so we can. So you have the lessons that that CurePod created for you. And again, you can go in and say, should schools have a three-day week? Can I add a hyphen? Um, I want to edit this a little more. And then you can edit the actual activity over there. Is it an open-ended question? Am I creating a word cloud? Does it do drawings? Um, how long will the students have to write? Can they do more than one answer or just one answer? Can participants re vote or not and how will it display the results so this this is one now notice if i were to go back i can add different lessons in see this is the right feedback that it generated things from i can start and create my own from scratch if i want to but a lot of the power comes in having it create it for you and when you do an AI feedback, the way that works, um, we're going to do present. What you do is you, you, you have to have, and so I'm going to use my phone just so you can see what this looks like on the student end. And I need to go to Curry.live and then put in the pin as you can. I don't know if you can see that, but notice that it's a very simple process to put it in. So you can see it's work on a tablet, a Chromebook, a phone. Very easy to for a student to join. 47066. And you notice it has a very um, um, you know, it has the animated music that goes along with things just like a, a Kahoot does. I believe Kahoot is an investment correct, actually. So you'll notice it will ask me for my real name, but on the screen, I don't show up as a real name. Um, it shows up as a happy fish. But as a teacher, I can see who was actually who. Um, but this way, when the when you display the results for students, they won't know who each other is, but you'll know who they are. So then I will go ahead and proceed with the lesson. I'm going to actually lessen the time. 
So should schools have a four day school week? I'm gonna push play and let me show you what happens. It displays a screen where I can type my answer as a student. And I would say, yes, because I get fired. It will, and then it submits my answer and notice it's saying waiting for feedback. So what happens is as a teacher, I you can, it'll show you all the answers that you received, but then notice on here, it will give me feedback. I'll read it to you. Wonderful start with sharing your thoughts. It's great that you have an opinion on whether schools should have a four day week. To add even more to your writing, maybe you could talk about what would you, you would do with your extra day off. Would you rest, play, or maybe read your favorite book? It's fun to think about the possibilities. Keep sharing your ideas. And remember, every time you write something new, you keep getting better at it. Keep it up. And remember, this activity was focused on writing. So it's giving me feedback on how I can make my writing better. Not too shabby, right? And notice as a teacher, when you see, you get to see all of the, all the things that are going on. And if you were, and if you were to click, Notice you can also see the feedback that, Cure, that the CurePod AI is giving to the student. So you're able to kind of see what they're saying to them as part of the writing process. Now, what did you learn from your feedback? Again, I'm gonna keep it very short. And on the screen, it's telling me to get ready to answer. So I get three, two, one, and then I get a chance to answer that I need to write about what I will do on my I go ahead and submit that. And what it will do with the timer is you notice you can adjust the timer. You can even add 30 seconds if you notice like kids need more time. Once all the students are done, it'll give you the option to give the results, but it will also cut off the students if they're not finished, and then it, you can just proceed to the next part. So notice, notice that on this one, it doesn't give the feedback to me directly. It puts it up on the big screen for everyone to see. Now it's saying, let's do it one more time. And I'm going to condense my time. Play. Notice I get the three, two, one. So I'm going to type, I would go to the library and study for my classes. I will also so I'm typing and I'm submitting. Again, because I'm the only student, it does it as soon as I'm done, but usually it will go the whole time to do that for all the students. It will give me feedback. And notice I will wait for this feedback. Oh, I got feedback. And it said, here's what it says. Wow, I'm impressed with your response. It's great to hear that you use the extra day off to go to the library and study. That shows you're responsible and care about your learning. I should say that I this was made for about a sixth or seventh grade level. So it was, was meant to be sent back to a middle score. It's also good to know that you understand how important sleep is for your health and doing well in school. Next time you might tell me a little bit more about why you think four day week is good or bad idea. Keep the great thinking and writing. So you notice it has a it has a real sandwich method to it. It's like positive, what you can improve, and then a positive at the end as well. We'll do one. How can and then I could do one more or I can just hit end lesson. And you'll notice that I can go to the report page and I can find out how my participation was. You can actually, with the premium version, get some, it'll give you some student insights. You can see how the chat went for that specific student. You can also get summaries for all your participants. So there is it doesn't track it students don't have accounts on this which is why it's much easier um, to for them to keep to privacy 
and they do actively work. If a student adds their personal information, they actively look for it and take it out. That's in part of their privacy policy. But um, you can, you know, it, but there are report capabilities. And again, it goes by the student's identified name in the thing. And it will never show on the screen. You can change that option, but I, it's the default and I would leave it that way because then you won't get inappropriate names. But you'll see all the learning objective, who the, who the student, what the student called themselves, but then what were they called on the screen? So if you remember, oh, I got to talk to Happy Fish. They were kind of a troublemaker. You'll remember who Happy Fish was. Um, and then it, and then it gives you a lesson summary. And again, it gives you some things that you can do. So that is CurePod. I think you could see how there, I did it with a very short activity. You can do it up to a full lesson. You can do it as a brain break. You can do it as a short activity for a specific thing. You can do it with writing. It talks to historical figures. Um, there are math ones. There are science ones. So it has a lot of versatility as far as subject matter. And this is something <laughs> I think you could see. You could use as young as kindergarten. I really think you could. But it has the power and sophistication, I think, to be used up to 12th grade to help with that engagement. Um, thank you again for your participation in this Bite Size PD. Hope you enjoyed us as we explored CurePod. Uh, thanks again. Um, here's all the links where you can find all the information. And most importantly, if you would like relicense your credit, I would highly encourage you to go to that um, link right there that will take you to a Google survey um, where you'll do a where you'll record your attendance so that we know to give you relicense your credit. Um, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed our adventure with CurePod and student engagement with AI.